Now, the Liberal Party's crucial decision on whether to support or oppose the Indigenous voice is looming now, with a special meeting slotted for this Wednesday. Shadow Indigenous Affairs Minister Julian Lisa gave us a bit of a steer in a major speech today. First, he had a go at the government's top-down approach and its confused messaging. Fair enough. Fair criticism. And he pushed for local and regional voices to be established first so they can feed into a national voice. So I'm calling on the government to re-embrace the principles of the Kalma Langton report, to allocate funding in May's budget for the establishment of the local and regional voices, to start the policy work on how to do this, and we will back it in. Yeah, the voice does need to stem from the grassroots, but this is a last-minute condition that could have been made nearly a year ago, and the Coalition was slow on all this. They should have done all that in government. And anyway, given all this would happen under legislation, there's nothing stopping a future Coalition government making the voice as local and as regional and as grassroots as possible. When it comes to the actual constitutional change, Lisa wants to get rid of the second clause now, a new position from the Liberals. This is the clause that says the voice can make representations to parliament and executive government. Why allow room for a debate about whether a particular government entity is or is not part of the executive government? Look, this argument is drastically overstated in the fear campaign being waged against the voice. If the voice offers advice on areas that don't make sense, it'll be easily ignored. It'll make itself irrelevant. Its advice is non-binding anyway, so it can't do anything, it can't change anything or stop anything. The voice will only have political influence, political authority, when it offers compelling advice on issues that matter to Indigenous people. It's as simple and as obvious as that. Do the voice opponents really want to run a scare campaign about the voice making non-binding recommendations about whether interest rates should go up or not? It is absurd. Look, Lisa says he backs the voice in principle, so he should be constructive, not play games. Most of these scares are just attempts by people opposed to the voice in principle trying to generate fear and confusion. The big question is whether the Liberals will outright oppose the voice or allow their individual members to argue either side of the debate, you know, like Liberals. In relation to the Liberal Party uh, and our position, we will uh, determine our position uh, on this after considering uh, the, the, the proposal in full. Um, I hope the Prime Minister will heed my words today. I hope that they will change course. Um, and that will be on Wednesday that that decision on, will be on made? On Wednesday, we are having a, a party room meeting to determine, uh, to determine our position and to determine our way forward. So that's where we're at. Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall in that meeting? Now, let me make one important, cold, hard political observation here that remains true whether you support the voice or not. And it's very pertinent in the wake of the Aston by-election. The big issue for this country, for voters right now, the mainstream concern is cost of living, cost of electricity, cost of groceries, mortgage repayments. The voice is unlikely to be a vote changer for middle Australia. And every minute spent attacking Labor over the voice is a minute not spent putting them under pressure on electricity prices, on inflation and on higher super taxes. The Liberals have to choose their fights. If they choose this one, it'll be a high-stakes gamble for reconciliation and for the Liberal Party's medium-term prospects.